Welcome everyone uh, to the November meeting for the Field Naturalist Club. My name is Corey Reno. If you don't know, I'm the current club uh, vice president. Um, though I'm not able to meet in person tonight, it's uh, great that we can still meet uh, in person on, online here, uh, live. Uh, so thank you for joining for this uh, first live uh, meeting presented over Zoom. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's guest presenter, uh, Ryan Wolf. Uh, Ryan will talk about the blue racer snake uh, in Canada, uh, the subject of his master's research project. So uh, Ryan studied environmental science at McMaster University for his undergraduate degree and is currently in his master's program at the University of Toronto in the Department of Ecology and Evolution Bio Biology. Uh, Ryan has an extreme passion for conservation and science and has a very special place in his heart for reptiles and amphibians. He's also an amateur uh, nature photographer, so all the photos that you'll see tonight in the presentation will be his. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Ryan. And Ryan, it's all yours. Awesome. Thank you, Corey. Well, hello, everyone. It's nice to meet you all virtually. I know it's kind of weird that everything's online now, but I'm glad that we're able to do this. Uh, I just want to say thank you to all of you for coming and a special thank you to Corey and Karen for getting this set up for me to do this presentation for you guys. So I'm going to be talking about the blue racer snake and my master's project. Um, and I'm going to do a present, I'll do a little presentation view here um, so you guys can see some images and whatnot. If I, at any point in time, my voice cuts out or anything or legs, just feel free to unmute yourself and just say something. And then I can, uh, I can try to fix that and make sure we're good to go. Um, and yeah, I'll try to make it a timely when it's reptiles and amphibians, I can get going and I talk a lot. So I'll try and go through it fairly uh, decently speed. Um, also, Corey said there'll be a question period at the end. Uh, if you do want to write in the chat box during the presentation, feel free. And then I can go through that chat box um, at the end and answer those questions. Because I know sometimes you can forget them by the end of the presentation um, or whatnot. So, so feel free to do that as well. Okay. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, share my... Oh, here we go. I'm going to share my presentation here and then we'll get going. Okay. Can everybody, oh, can everybody see the presentation? Yes. Yes, we're good. Okay, perfect. Great. All right. I will get going then. So, uh, as you now know, my name is Ryan Wolf. Uh, I am studying ecology at the uh, University of Toronto under Dr. Niall Rawlinson. Um, and I'm working in Essex County on Peely Island, um, working on the blue racer snake and conservation for that, for them. So, these are and this is one of the images I took of two blue racers. Right from the get-go, you get to see the snake. So for those of you who don't know uh, anything about the blue racer, the little bit of its life history, you get to see a picture here of its scales and uh, of its face up in the top right. So they are generally a, a gray snake um, with blue sides, or sometimes they're a bit more dull, and sometimes they're bright blue. This example on the bottom right photo is a, is a pretty typical blue racer um, in Canada. They're, they're a little bit duller than some, some of the other places they exist. Um, but they do have that blue sides and they're gray to brownish on top. They have a nice black mask um, covering their eyes, as you can see up here. Uh, and then they have a little bit, little brown nose, brown to orange nose. And so they are the second largest snake in Ontario only beaten by the black or gray rat snake, um, and they can get up to about six feet. So they are a pretty large snake, 
Um, and they're also one of the fastest snakes in North America, and they're actually the fastest snake in Canada. And they can go up to seven kilometers an hour. Uh, and that doesn't sound that fast because maybe some of you are like, oh, I know people who can run that fast. But when you have to try and catch these snakes as they go seven kilometers an hour through the grass, <laughs> through the long grass, I'll tell you, they are, they're hard to catch. They're very, very fast. And that's where their name comes from. So the blue racer, and this is important to remember, is that they occupy uh, open canopy ecosystems such as savannas and grasslands. Uh, and so that'll be important to remember. Now, in terms of their prey, they are what we call generalists, and that means that they eat uh, just about everything. Um, their main food sources are rodents and birds, uh, and kind of frogs too, I'd call them a main. Uh, and the little babies eat insects. But one thing that they also eat that not a lot of people know about is that they eat other snakes. And oftentimes it's mostly just the Eastern garter snake where we find the blue racers in Canada but they have been known to eat Massasauga rattlesnakes when their ranges overlap, such as in Michigan. And uh, yeah, so the last thing I wanna say is that they are arguably the most endangered snake in all of Canada. And there's three main reasons for that. It's basically their range, that they're really restricted. They only live on Pelee Island now, and they have a very small population size, we think. Um, and the obvious threats of road mortality and things like that. So now that you know a little bit about the snake, we'll talk about its history in, oh, there we go, in Canada. So in Canada, the Blue Racer only ever existed in Ontario, but they existed across a fairly good chunk, likely, of southwestern Ontario. So they never got reported until, um, about the mid 1900s and before that it was assumed uh, and it can be extrapolated that they lived kind of across much of southwestern Ontario where the savannas and prairies and grasslands existed um, but when they started being recorded you can see on this image on the left um, where they existed all the way up until 1983 was the most recent observation so they were up by the Pioneer Provincial Pinery Provincial Park uh, and the Asable River. And they're also down on Point Pelee National Park, uh, I think as late as the 1970s. Uh, and then, of course, they existed on Pelee Island. Now, they, they used to be found in these areas, but because of habitat loss, as I'm sure all of you are aware, especially in Essex County, we've lost so much of the natural lands. There's only about 3% of the natural areas remaining. Um, so you can imagine blue racers and many snakes lost their habitat um, and, and were lost from the county. Uh, and blue racers are no exception to that. They were lost from everywhere except for Pelee Island. And that's because Pelee Island uh, actually has a lot of natural areas remaining still. They have about 20% of their natural areas protected and they have closer to 30% of what we would call natural habitat not necessarily for the blue racer, but uh, their natural areas nonetheless. So like I said, they haven't been seen on the mainland in about 40 years, which isn't that long, um, but it's been, a, it's been quite some time. And so we're likely not gonna see them there again unless we reintroduce them. Now they only live on Pelee Island since 1983, and they only live on approximately the Eastern two thirds of the island. And that's because even on Pili, where we have all that natural land remaining, we still have habitat loss there. And you can see on this, on this little map, the range of occurrence of the Blue Racer. And it's in this kind of uh, hashed line where they exist on the island. And these darker areas are big habitat patches that are suitable for the Blue Racer. So, there used to be on the island, there used to be a lot of savannas, alvars, and grasslands uh, that, and marsh that was converted into farmland. Uh, and a lot of that's still farmland, but some of it got regrown into grasslands and uh, the races were doing well. But over time, in the last 20 to 30 years even, 
a lot of those areas that were savanna are now being overgrown by dogwood and other shrubs and it's it's really taking a toll on the habitat of the blue racers and they're losing their habitat even where they remain so in previous uh research endeavors the uh, the blue racer was first actually officially studied by Ben Porchuk um, on Pelee Island from 1993 to 1995 or 1996, and uh, he did a lot of what we what we now know about the blue racer. He told us what their active ranges are, where they nest, how many eggs they lay, what time of year they mate, all of it. But he did a really good job of of understanding the, the basics of the Blue Racer uh, and how they were living at the time on Pelee Island. And he so he uh, had some assistants. One of them was Rob Wilson, uh, who later, five years after Ben had finished his study, did a population estimate for the Blue Racer, um, kind of setting a baseline for, for future monitoring to, to check the population estimate every five years and keep an eye on Canada's most endangered snake. Um, after these researchers were on the island, though, there's a big falling out between, um, well, all research, but mainly the snakes and the islanders. And there hasn't been any research since 2002 on the blue racer until now, until we started this project one or two years ago. And so this is really important because we don't know anything about this snake in the last two decades. We have a few observations from people who seen them and submitted them, but we don't really have an understanding of how many snakes are left or where they are now. So that's where I come in. And so my master's project is looking at counteracting habitat loss. Uh, and I'm also, to start that, I'm doing a population estimate like Rob Wilson did to see how many are left. And then we will know where and uh, how urgently we need to do this habitat management. Um, but I'm also just, for the sake of the species and for the racers and for other species as well, there's snakes and, and birds and such. Um, we want to manage the habitat so they don't become this shrub thicket that you can see on the right. So individuals like Jeff Hathaway, who helped on the projects back in 2000 and 2002, um, he's been going down at once a year, every year on the May 2-4 long weekend to look for racers um, and look for fox snakes and just take a group to the island to to see the biological uniqueness that is there and where they used to see tons of these snakes you're talking like 10 a weekend pretty easily they now see zero because these areas like on this picture here used to be grassland where those where those snakes were abundant and now, and uh, you can see this is this picture was taken in fall, so you can't really see the leaves. But you can imagine with all the leaves on, that's completely shaded out, and it's just shrub thicket. So I'll be doing a population estimate, and then um, trying to see how we should manage these properties to bring back the grassland uh, alvars, savannas, and the open canopy habitats that the blue racers require. Uh, yeah, so I just kind of explained that. I should have clicked forward a bit, maybe. There we go. So population uh, population estimate, how many snakes are left? Um, so I am doing a three-year study from starting in this year, 2020 to 2022, where we do intensive daily surveys across Pelee Island where the racers exist. Um, and we are we are counting how many we see, recording their locations, and then we record their weights and their lengths and everything so we can understand uh, not only how many races are left, but what condition they're in. Um, we can tell their physical health this way, and we can see um, whether or not they are, they are still doing well in some of these areas. So on the, on the picture here, you can see this snake, her name is Roxy. And she's about five and a half feet long. And she is the, the last blue racer that I saw this fall. Um, 
and she was absolutely gorgeous. And it was October 23rd, which was much later than you might expect. Um, but those days were great because I actually saw five five blue racers in one day, which is pretty pretty spectacular. Now, some of the other snake species we see while I'm doing this population estimate are this one, which is the eastern garter snake, but this one's melanistic, which means it uh, produces the black pigment and not so much the other ones. We see little uh, baby brown snakes. And here's another blue racer in what I call... Uh, and uh, one of the hibernation complexes, there's a little hole underneath this tree, and uh, he was just tucked in and under there, uh, about to go down for the winter. All right, so habitat management. There's two different management practices that we're doing on some of the uh, nature reserves on the island, and one of them is prescribed burn. So on the Ontario Nature Stone Road Alvar, they had a, a crew come in on September 6th, I think it was, of last year, and they burned this grassland ecosystem to keep it as a grassland and to stop some of those shrubs coming in. Now this image on the left is a really good part of the alvar, which is still good snake habitat. But if you look on the right, you can even see some of the shrubs um, on, the, on this side here on the left-hand side of the picture. Um, and those are what we're trying to burn back and stop from coming in and taking over the remaining parts of this nice habitat and hopefully restoring more of that uh, grassland. So it was about 11 hectares and the burn went well, but it was we had some difficulties with wind and weather. And so it was a low intensity burn and only burned about 50% of the area. And uh, a lot of the grasses, of course, were burned and the small uh, forbs and plants, but a lot of the woody shrubs were, were not too affected. Um, and so it didn't really do that much except for hopefully hold them back from getting further along. So we hope to do another burn uh, in a few years, but that was the status of that habitat management. And then if I can go to the next slide here. Uh, we did mechanic removal. And so, of course, with those shrub thickets, uh, you need a pretty intense fire to, to burn that. So one of the options we're thinking about uh, might be a better, a better start is to go in and actually cut down these shrubs. So myself and volunteers cleared over, actually, one and a half hectares, so about four acres um, between last fall and this fall. Uh, so no, none of the grasses were cut down um, or trimmed or mowed or anything, but about 80% of the large shrubs and small trees, which is mainly dogwood, so it was about 95% dogwood, um, were cleared, and they were going to put herbicide on them. We paint them. We don't spray. We just put a little dab of paint on their stems so they don't grow back. And so this is what it looked like before we cut down some of it, and this is just one area, but you can see this picture on the top right. It was completely shrubs. And again, it's fall, so imagine that with leaves on. And then this is what it looked like afterwards. It's the same, standing in the same spot, you can see all the way down the field. Um, and the grasses are still there. And uh, they've started to, that was from 2019. And this, this year, the grasses have started taking over a bit, which is really good. So, now, it's great to have these management practices, but for my master's, I have to look at um, the science behind it, and we're trying to determine the best management practice for restoring the habitat for Blue Racer on Pelee Island. So I'm measuring the change, ecological changes from each management practice, prescribed burn and mechanical removal, and I'm doing so by, seeing, by doing snake surveys, habitat surveys, and physical snake uh, analogs, which are basically just uh, temperature data loggers that I put out in the field. And so this will tell me how those management practices will affect the snakes. So I'll go over these pretty briefly. Um, but so, oops, so snake surveys, we do cover boards and visual encounters where we search for the snakes. Uh, whatever we capture, we measure their length, we measure their weight, and we pit tag them so we know which individual it was. So when we catch them again, we can. Uh, we can see who they are. Um, and then we also record 
uh, data on the eastern fox snake, which you are probably more uh, accustomed or aware of, considering that Essex County has a decent population of eastern fox snakes. Um, they are not the target of the study, but they are endangered species. And so, of course, when we see them, we want to make sure we collect data so that they could be used in future studies, or if there's something I can do with that, I will. So the habitat surveys, just briefly, I have a, a couple of transects on each property with habitat plots where I measure things like canopy cover, the percent ground cover, um, and woody debris and things like that. And I measure that uh, in the spring, in the summer, and in the fall. And basically I'm doing that before, I started doing that before we did the habitat management to see what it was like then, and then I do it afterwards. And then we can compare and see how those habitats have changed. Then I have those physical snake analogs I was talking about. And so basically they're just copper pipes that I made myself with my, with my uh, dad actually. We bought these copper pipes, put these um, PVC plumbing tube caps on, and uh, we actually sanded them down completely with 36 of these pipes so we could paint them the same color as the snakes. Um, and we put them uh, out in the environment with about 70% full of water. And uh, one of these little um, thermometers, we'll call them, they're, they're special thermometers, but basically I uh, waterproofed them and set them to record the temperature every hour for the entire field season. And so I put them out in the field and these copper pipes will tell me how the snake would experience the the temperatures in those habitats. Um, and so you can see here on the bottom right, a picture of a blue racer beside one of the pipes. Um, so this is important because obviously being uh, ectotherm, snakes need to thermoregulate and they do that by basking. So temperatures is a big, is a big deal for them and it, it can be very limiting. If the habitat isn't hot enough, then they're not gonna be able to thermoregulate and do all their life processes like uh, digesting food, foraging for food, mating, that kind of thing. So um, being an open canopy species, we expect them to need very uh, hot temperatures and these pipes will tell us how those change based off of the treatments that we, that we did, the prescribed burn or mechanical removal. So uh, that's the basics of my study. Um, and there's always, of course, a lot more going on, but I know time is, uh, is restricted. So I'm just gonna uh, give that brief overview. And I'm decided I wanted to share a few interesting things that I've found so far. And you can kind of see maybe from the pictures. So um, one thing I found is the population structure is immensely different between the survey type. So as I said, with the snake surveys, we have uh, visual encounter where we go and look for them um, just out and about and then we have cover boards and so we're seeing a lot of smaller and younger snakes under these cover boards and not really any of the adults and that switches for the vision encountered snakes we see a lot of big adults but not a lot of the young ones and that could be expected perhaps because we um, this maybe we expect the smaller snakes to use the boards more but it's an important to note because if you were only to do one survey type, then you're gonna miss a lot of the population. So it's just an important thing to remember um, for future conservation efforts. So the, these snakes also have incredible growth rates. And I'll show you a picture in a second of, of what I'm talking about there. Um, and then we also got a gravid female. So if you look on the right here, this is a picture of me holding her. Her name's Mama. And she had about 13 eggs as you can kind of see the little bulges here um, in her belly. So um, we caught her, of course, we measured her, weighed her, tagged her safely and gently because she was, uh, she was gravid or pregnant. Um, and then we put her back in the field and she would have laid her eggs probably within the, uh, the few days following of our capturing her. But it was exciting. It's the only one I've seen so far that had eggs in her, and, and you don't see those often because they, they tend to stay really close to nesting areas and stay hidden. And then neonates. So in the, if you remember back to the two studies that um, I mentioned at the beginning by Ben Porchuk and Rob Wilson, 
they didn't see hardly any babies, which are, is another name for neonates. Uh, they didn't see any baby blue racers except for on the roads in the, in the, uh, in the fall and late summer when they hatch out and a lot of them get hit on the roads. Unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of the same thing. As you can see in this bottom left picture, we get a lot of these dead babies, but we actually are seeing a lot of these live ones too up on the top left. So that's a good indicator that they're at least still reproducing at decent numbers and we're actually seeing a lot of these snakes. So that was a really exciting and really uplifting um, uh, find. So, growth rates. I promised I'd show you a picture. If you take a look at this snake with me, this is a baby blue racer. It would have been born, um, well this one I found her in, or him sorry, in uh, June of 2019 and he would have been born in September of 2018. And so when we first found him, it was June 25th, he was about 43.15 centimeters uh, SVL from his snout to his vent um, and um, almost 60 centimeters total length and only a little tiny guy at 34 grams. Then we caught him again. Uh, and this, oh, it looks like a, a much bigger snake, right? Two weeks, two and a half weeks later, that's all. And the snake went from this with the pattern and started to lose its pattern and turn into uh, an older looking blue racer. And so in just two weeks, it grew over, uh, or almost 10 centimeters in SVL, sorry, and almost 10 centimeters, or over 10 centimeters in full length, and almost, not quite, but almost doubled its weight. Then we found him again, and this, this snake is way bigger. That was only September 4th. So it's only a matter of a few months, and this snake has grown 20 centimeters, and has quadrupled its weight now. It's 136 grams. So this snake, that's a pretty long snake, over two feet long, almost three feet in total with his tail, that would have been born uh, exactly one year before this picture of me holding him. So that's pretty impressive growth rates. Uh, and of course, they slow down when they become adults and really large, but that's, that's pretty quick and pretty impressive. And so, What's next? I have one more year of the post-treatment data collection. So I've done one year this year, uh, and the year in 2019 I did it before we did the treatment, uh, and I've got one more year after this for that, and then I've got two more years of the population estimate surveys and a whole heck of a lot of statistical analysis to do on my computer, which is what I'm doing now because it's now winter. Um, though we've had really great weather. And then, so after the statistical analysis, I want to provide conservation strategies to the landowners um, and basically provide best management practices so we can uh, recover habitat and maintain the habitat for the blue racer, the most endangered snake in Canada. So that's the presentation. I just have a couple of pictures just for fun to show you guys. Um, this is uh, again, of course, blue racers. On the, on the left here is a picture of the body size of mama, which was the big pregnant female, and then uh, another racer named Judy. And they were about the same length, but look how much bigger she was, right? Um, and even her head size, she's a lot older. Uh, and they tend to grow and be, uh, and as they get older and older, they get a lot thicker. But of course, she also has eggs in her, so she's a bit larger. Then I have this kind of interesting note. So this fox snake on the left got hit by a lawnmower and had this huge gash in her side. We rubbed alcohol on it and tried to clean it as best we could. And we found her again about a month later and is completely healed over and she was doing just fine. She put on a lot of weight and she looked great. So just the resiliency of the snakes. Um, and then this one, this is Dive. He's a blue racer um, that, as you can guess maybe by the name, I actually dove about eight feet through bushes and poison ivy to catch him. Um, so that was pretty fun. And I've got a lot of stories like that about how crazy it is to try and catch these snakes when you're just, you find them going through the grasses. So please feel free to ask me about that too. <laughs> I've got a lot of stories. Um, 
And then I think I've got one more pictures and then we'll open up the question. Oh, so here's some of those. I told you they were big snakes and I wanted to show you. So here's some of the bigger racers I've caught. This is T. Ken. He's a, he was a big male I caught last spring. Uh, he was about five foot two and a half. And then we've got this monster who, I've, who I never actually named, um, but he was five foot eight and a half. So you can just imagine, I'm sure as he's just as tall, if not a little bit taller than some of you, and he's close to my height too, and and be close to some of some of you others. So that's pretty impressive. And uh, he would have been he would have been a really old male to be that that size. And we don't see too many that size, but that's how big they can get. So I just want to open it up to questions and say thank you so much for uh, listening to the presentation. So it looks like we've got our first question here on the chat line. So the question was, how long do they live? Right, so yeah, I get this question quite a bit. Um, they are a species that lives a very short life and they, because they grow very quickly and reproduce very quickly. So we don't know exactly how long they live, but it's estimated to be about 10 years in the wild. Um, and that's if they live a full life. So a lot of the times they don't actually get to be that age, um, whether they get hit on the roads or they die at overwintering, which is a pretty common cause. They, we lose, we think about 40% of the population of the adults every year to overwintering uh, mortal, mortality. So that's, that's pretty crazy. Um, and uh yeah so they they grow really quickly the males reach maturity at one year and the females at two and so that's biologically taxing so they don't live a very long time whereas rat snakes might live 20 years there's another one uh so i'm going to read off the chat here if that's okay Unless Corey, do you want to ask them or should I read off the chat? Yeah, you could read it off. That's cool. Okay. So Eileen says, can they be reintroduced to Point Peely or Ojib Ojibwe? So what in the recovery strategy, it is um, one of the mandates to look at reintroducing them to the mainland. Um, and first they want to secure the population on Peely Island. So we need to do that when protect them where they are. Um, but then we can look at reintroducing them to the mainland. And I've put a lot of thought into this myself. Um, there's not a lot of habitat remaining. Ojibwe is great because a lot of work has been done and it's become prairie, but the government um, in, in general, I don't think would be in support of that because they didn't exist there before or that we, they probably did, but I mean, we don't have records of that. So it'd be harder to get them to reintroduce them in a place like Ojibwe, but we could look at potentially doing it um, at Pine Ridge Provincial Park Point Pelee has two forested now. Um, there's, it's just all forest and marshland. It's beautiful, but it's not habitat for the blue racer. Um, so it can't be reintroduced there. So we'd have to look at probably creating habitat somewhere like Pioneer Provincial Park um, or up that way or, or convince them to reintroduce them into areas that we now have that would be suitable. Um, okay, how long do they live? Oh yeah. Uh, is the blue racer, in, Ellen says, is the blue racer endangered in the United States? Have there been conservation efforts there? That's a great question. Um, so the blue racer is found, I think, in a number, I think like seven to 11 states or something like that. And they're only a species of special concern in one. So they are a very common snake in the U.S. Um, you can find them in Ohio, all the way over to uh, southern Illinois, uh, and then up to Wisconsin. Um, and so they're, they're pretty abundant in areas like Michigan and Northern Illinois uh, and even Wisconsin and things like that. But um, they, are, I think in Ohio is where they're a special concern, but in Canada, it's the only place where they're endangered. And we have a unique situation here because they're also stuck on an island. So that, that furthers their, um, their endangerment because if if one we get one really bad winter or something the whole population is right there and we could wipe out a big chunk but one thought for the to connect that to the reintroduction thing um, is that if they're abundant in the U.S. would it be possible to take some of their snakes and bring them here and reintroduce them or add to our population and it's it's uh it's a 
it's plausible. Uh, it's just a matter of getting the governments to cooperate and, and do that. It's pretty easy to get those snakes from the states because they are common. So I hope that answers that question. Uh, oh, and the con there hasn't really been too many conservation efforts there because they're so common. And you can imagine a lot of people do studies on garter snakes here or other places because they're common. It's always, it seems to be we put an emphasis on those that are really at risk first and we want to study those, um, which has its ups and downs. But uh, yeah, so there's not a lot of work that's been done on them. And so this is, this study I'm, I'm hoping uh, produces something very valuable that can be used for one of the earliest conservation efforts for them. Uh, Jessica says, what kind of reactions do you get from local people on Pili Island? Have you done any outreach yet? Sorry if this is already answered. Oh, you joined late. That's all right. No, Jessica, I haven't. I mentioned that. I did mention a little bit of a squabble. Um, so the history of Pili Island uh, with snakes is a, is a tough one to navigate, and I'm going to do so delicately. Um, the island is fantastic. The islanders are great. They actually maintain a lot of this habitat on their own and they, uh, they do a really good job. But there was a bit of a, um, a history between government policy and uh, observations of blue races on people's properties and it limited what they could or could not do. And so they were pretty upset, which is why there wasn't any uh, research done in the last 20 years or so. Um, but so I have been doing outreach. I've been talking to a lot of people and I generally get a really positive response now. Times have passed. Um, the policies from the government have changed and uh, people are a little bit more aware and open to conservation, uh, the importance of conservation. And so I, a lot of times I get, why do you study these snakes? Why do you study the snakes? Like you do that. Like I don't want any part of it, but like do your own thing kind of. Kind of thing, or I guess some people who are really, really supportive. Um, and I've only had a few people who are are very um, not resistant, but kind of don't really want to get involved and don't really want to want to uh, be a part of it because they are nervous about what happened last time. Um, and so I kind of get a mix a mixed reaction, but I think it's all in all, it's pretty positive. And I've actually had a lot of support from um, specific people with critical habitat on their properties. And a lot of people support me in my population estimates. I have some private land that I survey. And uh, actually the, the mechanical removal treatment uh, is actually done on a private property as well. John DeMarco, he's a, he's a really big part of conservation efforts down there. So I want to applaud Peely Island, the, the local people there for all of their, their efforts and help as well. So it's been pretty good. Great. If anybody else has any questions, uh, feel free to either type it in the chat or uh, just unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and ask the question. How long overall is this project going to be, uh, Ryan? It sounds like it's a few years, uh, quite an undertaking. Yeah, so um, great question, Alan. So uh, we started doing the first kind of pre-monitoring for the prescribed burn before my project they started in 2018. And I looked at it and well, I mean, we were just, we had to do that because the government, you have to kind of show that you, created a benefit for the species. Um, and so we were monitoring them to see the effects. But then I looked at it and I said, this is grounds for something really that needs to needs to happen and, and a big project that could that could be beneficial to these snakes uh, in the long term as well. And so I, I put it all in order and got it going for last year. And my master's itself will go from I started last year, 2019, we'll end uh, the last bit of it in 2022. Um, and then I'm hoping that I have a lot of other ideas and a lot of other things that need to be addressed. More questions have come up and it's just a, just the beginning. So I'm hoping that maybe like a PhD or something can come from it and uh, it'll be more years. Um, 
but yeah, if, as of right now, the end date is 2022. Well, good for you. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Oh, I've got one on the chat. Uh, I mean, why did you choose this for your masters? Um, it's it's funny because it's not easy, and a lot of people they want to do uh, a master's they can kind of just hop into and and do it and check off the box and keep going. But it was it's very much just conservation oriented for me. Um, I mean, if you, you have arguably again the most endangered snake in all of Canada, hasn't been researched in over twenty years. We have no idea um, how they're doing down there on Peely Island, and so it was just, it needed to be done. And I had the gumption to go for it and do it. Um, they're my, definitely my favorite species. They weren't at first, but they've become it. I even have a shirt <laughs> showing Corey. I made a shirt of the blue laser and a fox snake with the Peely Island outline. Um, but so uh, it was just, I felt really compelled to, to try and make a big impact on, on this snake species. And so, I reached out to some profs and said, hey, I've got this idea. I've got this, um, got this desire to create some sort of management, create these best management practices so we can try and, and make a difference here uh, and see what's going on with this snake and hopefully keep it around for future generations. Um, to give you an idea, and this is what sparked my interest, um, was when Ben did his work in the mid 90s, he said there was about 300 to just over 200 snakes, adult snakes left on Peely and declining rapidly. And he expected them to be extirpated. So gone from the province at about uh, 2025. So in about five years time, you expect them to all be gone. Um, and then Rob Wilson, who did his study in 2000 to 2002 kind of supported that and he had an estimate of under 200 adults left on Peely Island and then 20 years pass and we don't even know how many are left so well good news is we've actually I've actually been finding quite a few um, so they're doing well but uh, it was a big push for me and an eye-opener to say this is something I could actually experience this snake species becoming extirpated in Ontario if we don't do something so that that's really where um, the initial thoughts came from Eileen, and that's why that's why I chose it as my master's project. Um, Carl asked, "How is my research funded?" Uh, so this was <laughs> a big part of um, me being able to do it because I talked to Dr. Niall Rawlinson, and he said, um, "I don't have funds for you, but if you can get funding, then like I would love to to be your supervisor on this." And so I went to Ontario Nature, who I was working for at the time, and uh, I said, um, would you be able to partner with me? There's this grant from MyTAC, which is just a, a business partnership kind of grant. So basically, uh, if you have a business partner, in my case, Ontario Nature Conser uh, Conservation Charity, who is willing to pay 50% of the funds, um, they'll cover the other half and they'll they'll pay for the project and uh, and basically the outcome is they wanted best management practices for the future so we can um, we can develop conservation strategies for the species and Ontario Nature was on board with that of course and and uh, it was, they had some money for their project being the prescribed burn anyways and so I was lucky enough to get some funding there and then I also applied for the species at risk stewardship program. And, uh, and yeah, so that, that I got funding from that as well, which covers the population estimate stuff. And I think. Great. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, if uh, there are no other questions, I just want to say on behalf of the club, just want to say thank you, Ryan, for taking the time tonight. It was a fantastic presentation uh, for joining us on our first uh, live Zoom presentation as well. I know I've learned a lot, uh, very fan fan you know, very fascinating uh, topic to hear. Uh, and you know, the effort, the conservation efforts are very important uh, for the species. So it's uh, 
it's great to see that this is going on right now. Um, so thank you on behalf of the entire club. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And that, uh, that concludes tonight's presentation. Uh, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you.